Okay, that's us. So hopefully you've all found the recordings uh, and are linked on Teams, and you can also get to them via Office 365 online. It's on the, the Streams tab. Uh, so I'll record these just in case you want to go over them again. Um, does anybody have any questions from last week? It's no. a very in-depth yeah, really. subject. Sorry, what, sorry? It's a very in-depth subject. I have, I have read loads and loads and loads. <laughs> There's always more to read. Um, yeah. That's why I've tried to kind of um, point to things that you will actually need on Moodle. So that's why they are there. But yeah, you can always fall into rabbit holes and there's a ton of it. It's part of the reason why the people that can do this stuff get paid so much money. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it is in depth. There's a lot to it. And um, that's why I'm looking for a fairly serious report as well. The one that you're going to show as an example of, remember? You're still banging that drum. Yes, I just need a guide and then I can start. That's how my brain works. Yeah, Tony, I think I second that. So I think you weren't joking last week when you said you were expecting 70 pages then. Say that again, sorry? I think you weren't joking last week when you said you expected 70 pages at the end of this. I wasn't joking last week when I was meaning an absolutely complete report. Okay. Whether it takes 70 pages or not, well, it's hard to know just now. But seeing as how you're all so worried about it, now I am going to zoom through this, okay? In part because I'm, in fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to zoom this. I'm going to leave it until after I stop the recording. Genuinely because um, <laughs> I don't want you slowing down the recording and just basically trying to read off it. So I, do, I have downloaded one um, from last year give you an idea and um, it's not 70 pages but it is 35 okay so don't let me forget once we've finished the lecture and once I stop recording I will show you this on screen I'll do it quickly so that you're not just reading the words because I don't want that to happen but it'll give you an idea of what you're looking for thank you it's just the layout I think I need to get right in my head yeah well the layout in this one um, actually fairly solidly follows the, the layout on middle um, and expands it. But we'll talk about it when it comes up. So, okay, yes, okay. don't let me forget, once the lecture's done, we'll do that, OK? Thank you. Uh, sorry, Jamie, what was the no for? Just an answer question you'd asked earlier, so I just wasn't you got had the mic on yet, so all right, all right. All right. Um, nobody's got any questions. Oh, that's what it was, it was any questions from last week, presumably. Okay, so nobody's got any questions from last week. Um, can I just remind you all about uh, the quiz? So I've said it's not mandatory, I've said I'm not going to to mark it as such, although I'm happy to answer your questions on it. Excuse me. But only seven out of 15 of you have attempted it. I, I didn't it just because you said we're doing more of it this week. Yeah, but bits of it are um, 
from last week, bits of it are from this week, and it doesn't close. So what I was hoping you would do is do the bits from last week. I really can't stress enough how much better it will be for you if you actually try and do bits every week rather than getting to you know the end of April and trying to write 40 pages overnight. It just isn't going to happen. So try and do stuff every week and the quiz is there to try and prompt some of those things that you might need in your reports. OK, so we are going to move on today and we're going to do the next one on the list. Um, and this is a kind of. It comes under governance, it comes under risk, it comes under control. It actually comes under just doing things right. So this is actually a useful thing for pretty much anything you're going to do. So I've put it in here just to inform the rest of the stuff. It's uh, it's an idea about how organisations may approach uh, a problem because you get problems all the time with organisations. You have problems every day that you have to recognise and you have to solve. And there's a couple of techniques in here that I want you to think about when you're doing that. And it will help with some of your thought processes when you're addressing the case study. Now, I'm assuming you've all by now read the case study in detail. You've all by now gone away and done things like find out what a community development trust is and what kind of organisation it's going to be. So you'll have a good idea of the kind of things that you're going to need to do for it. If you haven't, again, now would be the time. Give it two seconds. I thought I had muted my devices. Clearly not. No, that's better. Um, so this is a overarching thing. It's just something to bring to bear in all the ways that you might approach things with any kind of organisation, not just this one. So when you are doing anything, hopefully the idea is to get better. Hopefully the idea is to do what you're doing, but better. However you define better. Making more money, having better customer uh, feedback, um, helping more people in your charity, whatever it's going to be, there's going to be things you can do better. And so part of what um, people do to effect change is to think about what they're doing, to make plans about what they could do better. They'll then carry out that plan. And then importantly, they will check to see whether what they've done has made better outcomes for them. Because there's no point in making a plan, doing things and then going, oh, that was great, we did that. You have to actually check that it worked. And then you have to act on those outcomes. It's an iterative process. So it's not just you do each thing in turn and you are done. You go around it again. Because if what you did, once you've checked it, hasn't worked out the way you'd hoped, you need to make you need to make a new plan. You need to address the issues that you had, make a new plan, and do new things, and check those, and then act based on the outcomes of those, and hopefully they worked. But if not, you plan again and you do new things, and you continue on this iterative process, well, forever. You never stop trying to get better. Not, hopefully, you never stop trying to get better. Does that make sense? 
Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, first thing you have to do is make a plan. You can't do anything without a plan. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever watched any of the, I don't know, maybe Apollo 13 or something, or any of these space things. And before the launch, all you ever hear is check system X, confirm, check system Y, confirm, check system Z. They've made a plan for everything that has to happen for a, a rocket to be launched. You can't do anything without a plan. I tell you to leave your house and drive to London. You don't just get in the car and start driving and stop every so often and say, am I in London? You figure out where you are. You figure out where London is. You figure out a route from where you are to London and then you follow that route. You make a plan. So you have to do the same in any other sphere. You have to decide what your aim is going to London. OK, so you need to be really clear what your objectives are and you need to make a plan for getting there. What is it that you're going to have to do to carry out that plan? You're going to have to do it. You carry out the plan and make sure that you have reached your objective. Now, often um, plans are big. Objectives are big. And it can be very difficult to reach big objectives in one bound. If I was driving to London, it's what, 500 miles and 11 hours. I might want to say something like, OK, instead of driving to London, I'll drive from here to Carlisle. I'll stop, I'll have a cup of tea and then I'll drive from Carlisle to Birmingham and I'll stop and have a cup of tea and then I'll drive from Birmingham to London. And then I'll be at my objective. I'll also make sure that I'm on the right road and I haven't accidentally headed off towards Edinburgh instead of Carlisle. So smaller steps towards a goal are really helpful. They're helpful for people planning it and they're certainly people helpful for the people that are implementing it. If you walk into somebody's house and say, we're going to London or we're going to the moon, they kind of go, what? But if your plan starts off, OK, first thing we need to do is make sure there's enough petrol in the car. That's something that's doable. That's a, oh yeah, I can see an end to that. And it's the same in any sphere. If you walk into a, a company and say, yes, our plan is to triple sales by next month. People will look at you and kind of go, really? Are you sure? Is that even possible? But what you do is you walk in and say, right, we're going to increase sales by 2% by next month. And 2% the next after and 2%. There's a progression, there's a thought that, okay, well, yeah, actually, maybe we could do that. It also helps to check what you're doing. If you're doing a change to our website because people aren't finding the information that they need, you might decide to design a new website to make it easier for people to navigate. You go away, you design it, you build it, you implement it. But what you don't do is check that people are actually getting to where they are any quicker. And in fact, what you may be better doing is making some small tweaks and actually testing. It's the sort of thing Amazon do all the time. They'll make small changes to their incredibly ugly front page. If they want to send people towards today's bargains, they might decide, OK, what happens if we put a button up in the top left here? What if we put the button over beside where you click buy now? What if we put the button up beside where it says Amazon? And they don't just go, well, I think this and I think that. They'll test it. So randomly, when you 
hit on the Amazon site, some of you will see the button beside the banner and somebody will see it on the left hand side and somebody will see it on up beside the buy now button. And they will look at the data. How many people that we showed it to in this position actually clicked on this thing that we wanted them to click on? Quite often they'll simplify it to just two options. Put it on the left, put it on the right. Which one works better? Put it higher, put it lower. Which one works better? It's called A-B testing. We do it all the time. Which makes it better or easier or more um, profitable? Which change is better for us? in any way that you choose to define better. So they do A-B testing and they'll check to see how we go on. So we do small things. We check where we are on the way to the big thing. We might want to make different choices and figure out which one actually works best for us. And all along the way, we are checking. We're checking where we are, we check where we're expected to be, we see if there's a difference. Are we there? Are we behind? Are we ahead? So you always check to see how you are compared to what you expected. Don't forget, of course, that your testing is part of that. If your testing is turning beside you and going to the person that sits in the same office, do you think this is better? And they go, aye, it's wonderful. It's not really testing. So make sure your testing process is robust as well. So you plan stuff, you do stuff, you check that it's working, then you act based on those outcomes. And you continue to make hopefully positive changes. But if they turn out to be negative, you're only making small changes so you can roll them back. You make these small changes, hopefully they work out. You reevaluate what's going on, and then you make a new plan, and that continues. So you continue around this cycle. And this slide shows a, a solved option, which is fine if you had a definite destination. We are going to get to London. Yes, we have solved it. But if the destination is we are going to provide more meals for homeless people, it's not really solved until there's no homeless people. So it's a continual process. So good organisations do this all the time. And it's not a do it and done situation. It's a do it and see whether you're happy or whether there's more improvement to be done. So you do it, you go through it, you get to what you hope to get to, and then you think, well, is there a new goal that we can get to? We got our 10% increase in sales. Can we do another 10%? So what happens is you continually move along this improvement process. And as you make improvements, they become the new baseline for what you're going to improve on. And you continually go up that quality improvement hill over time. Okay, so that's one of the techniques. Does that make sense? Anybody, any questions about that one? No. No, it doesn't make sense. I know you don't have any questions. <laughs> uh, no, it makes sense. Just don't have questions. So, if you're going to make a plan, the question becomes um, how do you actually make the plan? How do you decide what it is you want to do? Well, there's another technique that you can look at called five whys. 
the idea is that we um, inquire into the position that we're in just now and try and figure out why we are in that position. And again, it, it's a, an iterative technique. You continually ask why until you get to the root problem. It's called five whys because often five is about the number you'll need to get to the root problem. But it could be the three why, whys or it could be the 30 whys. It's just you continue asking. One of the things to be careful of with this one is because you're continually asking, you'll get to a single root cause. But actually, of course, for many issues, there may be multiple causes. So you need to make sure that you don't just go, oh, yes, we've found a cause. That's us done. You want to check that there's nothing else. So, for example, uh, we talked last week about delivery vans. So we've got a problem with our delivery van. It doesn't start. The first question we ask ourselves is, why doesn't the battery start? And we find out that the battery is dead. OK. Fantastic. We either charge up the battery or replace the battery and our van starts. Good for us. We found the problem. Let's move on with our lives. Would that be a reasonable way to approach it? Oh, yeah, but you don't know why the battery died. Do that again, sorry? Well, yeah, but you don't know why the battery's died in the first place. OK, so we ask why the battery died, and we might find out that the alternator's not functioning. So we replace the alternator. Bully for us, are we done? No. I've right. never done really any of these things. Well, we replace the alternator and we find out it hasn't worked. And actually, we find out that something called an alternator belt that takes power from the engine, turns the alternator and that supplies electricity to the battery and keeps it charged up. So we find the alternator belt is broken. So we replace that too. Are we done? Is the engine dead as well? Pardon? Is the engine dead as well? No. The engine's why, not dead. Why is the alternator, why is the alternator belt snapped? Somebody's supposed to be checking, like maintenance or you know, regular checking, servicing, to make sure everything is in perfect order before the, the belt worn out in the first place. Good question. Alternator belts have a useful service life. And actually, we find out that the alternator belt on this van was well beyond that and it hadn't been replaced. Which brings us to another why. Why wasn't the alternator belt replaced? And we find out that the van's not been maintained. So we've gone from the vehicle doesn't start to the battery isn't working, to the alternator isn't working, to the belt wasn't working, to, well, actually, we've never done any maintenance on this van at all, or at least not according to the recommended service schedule. So that's our root cause of what's gone wrong. <clears throat> and we see something well away from what the actual problem is. And we can actually add another why. Why wasn't the vehicle maintained onto the recommended service schedule because we don't have that in our organization we just don't have a process to do it because nobody's ever thought about it so we go back to our first technique so we plan we try and figure out what an appropriate maintenance schedule is and then we do it we implement that maintenance schedule and then we keep checking are the vehicles still breaking down? Not in general. So if a vehicle breaks down because it got a bust tire because it went over a nail, that's not because of this. We check, did it break down because of something to do with our maintenance schedule? 
And we might find actually that in these times, our maintenance schedules aren't aggressive enough. The vans are doing more work, they're starting and stopping more quickly, they are putting more strain onto their systems. So a standard 10,000 mile check might actually be dropped to an 8,000 mile check or a 5,000 mile check. And we go through the process again. We implement that new maintenance schedule, we check that everything's working and we keep going until we don't have our vehicles breaking down because of our maintenance schedule. Is that okay? Follow that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So who decides? Who decides what the problem is? Probably shouldn't be me. I'm not a mechanic. I may be nominally in charge of delivery vans. I wouldn't know an alternator if I fell over one. So when you're doing these things, you also have to consider who should be involved, who has the knowledge to actually work these things out, and then who has the knowledge and authority to implement the changes that are required. So there'll be different people that will require engagement. There'll be people that understand mechanics. There may be people who actually drive the vans. There'll be the management that are involved in actually doing this. Anybody else that comes to mind? Complete silence. Okay, well, you can have a think about that. But in either case, there should be a wide body. Enough to actually um, cover everything that's going to be required. And of course, you may have to consult people to understand who those people are. So you would get them together and. Well, probably not going to happen now, but in normal times you'd get them together and you'd use a, something that everybody can see, a big bit of paper, you know, one of those big, um, I don't know what you call them, those massive big A2 charts with pens on them. I'm sure they've got a fancy name, but I can't think what it is. Um, or we'd use a whiteboard, just something that everybody can see so that everyone can understand what it is we're trying to do. Write down the problem, make sure people are clear on what it is we're trying to solve. And hopefully we'll have enough expertise in the room to distinguish the difference between what's happened. The van doesn't start to the root cause. And it's important that we understand the difference in cause and effect. That just because something happens at the same time doesn't mean it's been caused by it. So again, that's where having expertise comes in. Once we think we have figured that out, we can kind of work backwards. The vehicle was not maintained according to the recommended service schedule and therefore the alternator belt was well beyond its useful service life and therefore the alternator belt broke and therefore the alternator wasn't functioning and therefore the battery was dead. So we can check our logic back the way as well to ensure that we're getting to the right thing.
So we can use and therefore as a sense check to understand what we're doing. It's important to work through each uh, part on its own. There shouldn't be a, oh yeah, jump from here to there and hope for the best. Instead, what we're hoping to do is make each link in the chain really strong to be sure that what we've done is the correct thing. So it's not just, well, I reckon that. You have to actually know. You have to have facts. And one of the things that's really important to, I was going to say to do, but to not do, is to not look at the people. This shouldn't, must not be a blame game. If people go into one of these things and just thinking, well, oh, if I say anything, they're just going to say, oh, well, look, I should have done this or I should have um, set it up. They're just going to blame me. You won't actually get a decent outcome. You won't get people who buy into it and will actually allow you to find an end cause. All you'll get is a bunch of people that are really suspicious. And that doesn't get you anywhere. But Tony, what if the, um, the, 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 what if the problem is human error, negligence? I mean, the root cause. Well, that then moves on to why was there human error? So say instead of the alternator belt broke because it wasn't replaced in time, say it was the alternator belt broke because it was badly fitted. The question then becomes, why was it badly fitted? It was fitted because the person who did it didn't have the knowledge. Why not? Because they hadn't been trained properly. Why not? Because we don't have a process in place to train our mechanics on um, the proper. I, I'm reaching my knowledge of mechanics here, of the proper way to do it. So yes, it may have been caused by someone, but there's a reason that that happened. Someone hired a mechanic. We hired a mechanic without the right qualifications. We didn't train a mechanic on a new uh, type of van. So we're trying to look at the process. That makes sense? Yeah, yeah, you know. Okay. Any other questions just now? Uh, it, I just heard a wee kind of squeak there. I don't know if it was a question or something was going wrong or. I think it was just people saying no. Ah, okay. So we want to assess the process. It may have caused an issue with people, but we want to assess the process to see why that happened. So we shouldn't leave it at a human error or blame Fred. We have to get to a point where we can actually trust people and trust that what they've done is according to our processes, because in the end it's our processes that are going to actually be used. And the other thing that we should always look at is from whose point of view is it that we're looking at this? In the end, it's going to be the customer's viewpoint. 
who is this going to affect in the end? OK, so that's just a couple of techniques that we can use to approach um, problems that we have. Any questions or comments about those? Got a question. No, nope. all happy. Hello. Yeah. In in our report, are we going to like use all these um, five Y's and all these and maybe develop into it right in part of the report? Or this is just like some kind of guidelines to what we're going to be doing? Well, that's going to be kind of up to you. So it might be something, it might be a technique that you use to get to your report. Or it might be something that you use uh, to recommend to people that they use to get to where they want to be. Because remember, your report can't say this is what you will do, but it might have pointers to how they're going to do things. So I'm not saying that you have to use it. I'm saying these are techniques and if they make sense for you, then use them. Okay. Any other questions just now? No. Oh. No. Okay. What I want to do then is have a quick look at some of the documents that are on Moodle. OK, so we looked at some of these last week. And so same. Um, same disclaimer as before, most of these come from the public sector. But all organisations should do it. It's just that the public sector have rules about ensuring that these sorts of things are put into the public sector. Now, can I just check something? Did that zoom for you? Yep. Yeah. 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 That yeah. wasn't working on Friday and I don't know why. OK, so what we have here is a plan for this council. And this is just the agenda. The actual plan is here. And it is massive. It's absolutely massive. Not surprisingly, because what you've got is an organisation that spends the £120 million a year, employs 6,000 people and has to look after everybody in this council area. So what they have to do is decide what their plans are going to be for the next wee while. And everyone has to decide this. So this is part of the governance part. Those who sit on North Ayrshire Council, the councillors, are those who have to make these decisions. And to help them make those decisions, they're given information. So there's a whole bunch of information that they're given here to help them make those choices. So that was from page... 49 through to page 56. But that's not the whole thing. What that is, is seven pages just for the agenda of this meeting. Some background, some information and proposals that they're invited to either accept or change, because that's what governance is. You can change these things. 
So you can say, no, actually, we don't want to do this. We want to do something else. So to inform this, there's a whole bunch of things that have been created. Remember last week we started talking about um, mission statements? Yeah, there's one there. Up front, where everybody can see it, and they're saying it's a council that's fair for all. That seems reasonable and easy to understand. And again, if there's any, if you disagree with this, please jump in. If you have questions, just jump in. It's signed off by the people and it tries to make it easy to understand what's going on. What is it we are going to look at? What is our vision? And what we are going to do? And some of the things that it has decided will be how they will approach this. Does anyone know how I take away the it's Firefox and I don't know how to take away that whole thing just to try and make that bigger. Never mind. That'll do. It tries to put this information in ways that people can understand. So this is a public document that will say we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and here's why. So it talks about an aging population or the number of children in poverty or um, the customer service. Now again, remember, you have different metrics depending on what kind of organisation it is. Customer service will be one. Children in poverty wouldn't, but change in profit might be. You have to decide what your priorities are. Specifically, what the priorities are, what they're going to go for. Perhaps in different areas. So in the place that you live, about what's going to happen in the future. And they'll put numbers against them. So again, uh, later on, we'll talk about controls. So these are controls. At the moment, the percentage of people, percentage of the population involved in local decision making is 51%, so that's 2017. And by 2024, they want to make it 60%. So they want to get a 20% increase. -ish. Percentage of council budget decided by the people, going from 0.6% to 2%. Average total tariff score of pupils, 875 to 890. So a more modest increase. It's still a target, it's still an increase. But what they've done is said, well, nah, people aren't suddenly going to be massively changed by this. So it's just a modest change. They've looked at the measures, they've looked at what they are, and they've looked at where they want to be. And they've got a plan to get there. So they're planning it, then they're going to do it, and later on they'll check against their targets. So part of the thing about checking isn't just that, oh yeah, have we done better? It's did we do what we said we would do, what we wanted to do, what we hoped to do? And it'll do this on all types of measures. So that's on communities, it's on place. Overall carbon emissions, let's drop it from 43,000 tonnes to 35,000 tonnes. Let's increase recycling from 55% to 62%. What about what we're going to do for the future? Can we get our um, customer service numbers up? Very modest target there from 84 to 85 percent, recognising how difficult it is to do that. Even less for employee engagement. 
And then to, to put in specifics. We will do this, and to do that, we will do this. We will do this, and this is how we will do it. We will expand early learning and childcare. How are we going to do that? Well, we need to make new places where we can supply it. And we need to partner with other people who can provide that service. So it's specific actions and a specific roadmap to get there. With at the end, specific outcomes in mind. They're planning it, they'll do it, and then they'll check it. And there's loads of these things. Remember, we started off this document at page 56. We're up at 80 and it's still going on. We're into the fourth appendix now. What are they going to save? Where are they going to save it? How much is it going to be? How does it fit in with the plans that they had? What's the reason for this? How have we checked that against what people actually want? I miss said the numbers, 385 million pounds that this council spends. They show where it's spent and ask where people want it to be spent. How did they do it? They got together. They did websites, did all sorts of stuff. And the people that they spoke to had specific priorities. And the ones that didn't get things like 96 or 95 percent, the ones that had 30 percent didn't end up in the plan. It wasn't a priority for people. Let's not do it. So that was from about page 40 to page 102, just for the plan and what they're going to do. It's comprehensive, it's been thought out, there's a plan for what they're going to do. There's a plan for how they're going to do it. And there's targets against which they can check whether it's worked. Sorry, that's just the same thing on its own document. OK, same sort of things. So this is the performance measures, all in a document, all easy to find. Same with the transformation, exactly how they're going to do it, so anybody can go to this and see it. I've even got posters that people can put up on the walls to show the sorts of things that are in the, the plan and putting them together as to how they're going to work. To try and get buy-in from staff, from partners, to say this is what we're going to do, here's how we're going to do it. Think about this when you're actually carrying out your duties. So any organisation will have these kinds of things. Any decent organisation will have these kinds of things. And they will be sitting in somebody's drawer somewhere and they'll be checked continually. And hopefully they're not just in somebody's drawer, they're in everybody's minds as they are doing things. And that's part of the governance function, to make sure that the organisation continues to evolve, to improve, to be better so that it can fulfill whatever it was the organization set up to do make money help people whatever anybody get any questions about that nope no questions for me 
Yeah, yeah, same for me. Does it make sense how it fits together? Yeah. Yeah. OK. All right, if no one's got any questions, I'm going to stop the recording then. Give me a second.